Welcome to Synced On Air, brought to you by Turfs Up Radio. I'm your host, Angelique Robb, and today I have Phil Graves from Dowtow. Welcome, Phil. How are you? I'm doing well, Angelique. Thank you very much. How are you? Good, good. Yeah. Glad we finally got to meet for the first time at Equip um, in 2023. So, yeah, and then you came to our show a couple weeks ago. Let's tell everybody a little bit about your background and what you've been doing in the industry lately. Okay, happy to, happy to. So I've been in the hardscape industry to one degree or another for about 22 years now. Originally started selling Belgard concrete pavers in central Texas, Austin, San Antonio, a little bit west Texas. Uh, then I went to work for Technoseal, who's based out of uh, Quebec in Canada, makes installation products for the hardscape industry, you know, polymeric sands, adhesives, uh, edge restraints, cleaners and sealers, things like that. Did that for 13 years and led U.S. sales for the last 10 of my time there. Um, towards the end of that, we were acquired by uh, Old Castle. So that's my second stint with Old Castle. Uh, and uh, at that point, you know, I had recently seen uh, porcelain pavers into the market. I, I eventually found myself in a position to have an opportunity to work for Dow Tile. Uh, leading their exteriors branded program for outdoor living products. And there's a bunch of them, like hundreds, thousands, even SKUs uh, for all environments. And so I've been doing that for the last five years for the, for all of uh, us and Canada. Fantastic. And why did you, why did you, what did excited you about going into porcelain paving then? Well, I was looking for opportunity at the time and uh, I had seen porcelain pavers four or five years prior when they first came to the U.S. and just thought that they had a tremendous future due to their high aesthetic value, their incredible durability, and the virtual, you know, virtual no maintenance aspect of them in terms of they don't scratch, stain, or fade. So really just a really enduring, beautiful aesthetic for outdoor decorative, you know, horizontal surfaces. Yeah. And so, so you've been traveling all over trade shows, um, events, rolling this out. And what do you think, um, I don't know, what, what are the biggest um, barriers to um, yeah. getting this out to everybody? I think, I think the single biggest barrier, Angelique, is just installation acumen, right? Knowing how to put them in in the right space, the right use, using the right installation system. So because mm -hmm. they're thicker than traditional tiles, their breaking strength is exponentially higher. So that means you can use them in unbonded, on-grade applications. You can use them in raised flooring applications on pedestals. Mm -hmm. um, then you can do bonded applications. You know, people think they're, they're very thin and very large formats. So when you compare it to a concrete paving slab, for instance, those typically wouldn't be recommended for vehicular use in an unbonded situation, whereas the breaking strength on porcelain maybe allows it to, depending on what kind of traffic you're exposing it to. So really that's it, it's, it's know-how in general and uh, for the application specifically. And then mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a historical hamstring um, when porcelain first came to the US, nobody oh. that was distributing, distributing it knew how to install it really in anything other than a bonded application. So oh, there really? were a lot of early failures. Yeah, a lot of early failures. And you're talking about 10 years ago. Are you saying, they you know, five years, years ago? Or... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, nine, 10 years ago is when they first started coming to market. Um, and really the first ones, if I remember correctly, was Mirage being distributed with Belgard on a national level. And that's sort of what opened up the hardscape installer base to the fact that porcelain is an option, right? Like a like a thin cut dimensional stone, for instance. Um, okay. So, so that got concrete or that got porcelain pavers into the sort of the hardscape world. Um, and then of course, 10 seconds after that, all the tile manufacturers and distributors that were buying much cheaper said, well, I'm going to go in there with a lower price. And so you had a combination of, you know, paver reps that were selling porcelain pavers and not really knowing the installation nuances from one material to the other. Okay. And tile guys coming in and, and sneak snaking that business on price and having no idea how to install. Well, I was going to say that's totally that's a total um, mismatch of uh, 
environments to lay in and a and lot of similarities similarities from one installation to the next but some significant differences right well and it's funny that you talk about that in particular because i remember in the uk um you know about 15 years ago you know, everybody started laying porcelain paving. Um, and at first they were recommending that it had to be, you know, you had to pour a concrete slab and then you had to bond to that. And then you're like, well, that's kind of an expensive way to install it. So do we have to do it like, you know, so again, we went through those iterations as well, but I, I don't think, um, in the UK from, I mean, I left about four years ago, but we were not doing unbonded porcelain paving. Correct. So UK is almost completely bonded to a thick mortar bed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it, so do you think that, well, I guess I, I'm just wondering, you know, that the methods that we were using there didn't translate very well to come over here from an education point of view, maybe, you know, if they're using, it's an Italian porcelain and coming over and that, that was another barrier to yeah. entry or. I, I think so. And I don't want to talk out of school about things I don't know for fact, mm. but I think that a lot more of the installers in UK were already doing like and similar methods with natural stone. Yes. And I think that in the U.S., the bulk of the hardscape market is guys dry laying concrete pavers. Well, I guess that's what I'm thinking, too. It does so it's a little seem... bit of a further, further step from current practices. Uh, well, it, that's good that you say that, because I guess that's my impression, too. Like, yeah. um, you know, it does seem like in Europe we are laying a lot more natural stone and it is all bonded and yeah. yeah. And so um, it's not that different. I think the, the problems that we were seeing, I guess, 10 years ago was cutting it um, yeah. was a big deal. And um, we did a lot of curves in our designs. And so that made the porcelain mm -hmm. like a lot more wasteful or, or yeah harder to deal with on site like we couldn't cut it on site but that's changed a lot too recently hasn't it correct as long as you've got the you know the right saw and the right saw blade and then you're using the right technique with the saw blade and not just trying to jam through it as fast as you can it, most porcelain should cut just fine hmm. it just is slower and it's a little bit rougher on the blade. So when you're figuring out your cost, you have to take that into consideration. That's all. Mm, yeah. Well, and so I saw recently, was it on LinkedIn or Facebook that you put a question? Um, it was Facebook. It was was Facebook. it Facebook? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I thought that was like, so I moved here four years ago. I just said that a few minutes ago. But, you know, I thought, you know, I'm looking around. I'm in south louisiana and i'm like there's there's not as many options with hardscape materials as i'm used to seeing right and just really you know still a lot of concrete driveways <laughs> you know poured concrete mm -hmm. which i know i mean in scotland we have freeze thaw cycles and it's spalling and you know it, it, it's more problematic to do um poured concrete outside and so I realize that, but, but I'm, I'm surprised around, um, so porcelain paving, what I like so much about it is that, um, as opposed to some of the natural so stones in a, in a slipperiness, like I love natural stone I love the look of it, but it can be really slippy. Like in Scotland, we had a lot of slate paving mm -hmm. and it looks really sharp, but if, if it's on a grade, it can be lethal. And so again, I like that porcelain paving has this, um, you know, the, the characteristic that you design to is to keep it from being slippy. So what, you know, are you seeing a lot of porcelain paving around pools and, and those kind of areas? Yeah, we absolutely are. Um, and, and I'm glad that you brought up the slip and skid resistance of porcelain because it does vary terms of the test methodology from one part of the oh. world to the next. Right? Okay. So 
In the U.S., we use something called dynamic coefficient of friction as the measure for whether or not it's going to be safe for use in a given area, right? If it's a commercial kitchen, if it's a shower floor, or if it's an outdoor commercial wet area sloped with minimal footwear, like a hotel swimming pool that's outside. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's out there. And the measure that we use per industry standard uh, is dynamic coefficient of friction or decoff. And per a newer ANSI standard 326.3, the recommend the recommended <laughs> standard. I know. Sorry. For, I was uh, like, for, whoa. Uh, outdoor, <laughs> I have to, right? Okay. <laughs> for outdoor wet areas is a minimum decoff of 0.55. Now, there's a lot of tiles in the market from India and Europe, especially, and a lot of them are under the R system. So a lot of them will say we're R11, so we're good for outside. Unfortunately, it may be, right? Maybe good for outside, but it has to pass the decoff test. Because if, well. not, if not, and somebody has a slip and fall and they want to sue, and then they test, and yeah, it meets R11, but it doesn't meet decoff, then there's still liability you know, there's still liability for the owner, the distributor, the installer. I mean, everybody. yeah. Everybody. Well, and how so, do they compare or do or, there's, or there's no it, direct comparison because the test methodology is different. So right? they different. don't test for the same thing. So there's no crossover chart for R11 equals whatever decoff doesn't exist. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So as an importer, be careful, right? Because yeah. we import at Daltile, we import. 14 SKUs for stock in the U.S. from our sister company, Marazzi, in Italy. But yeah. every single one is tested to the decoff standard with right in their test methodology, the BOT 2000. It's like a little, little robot car that just measures the resistance. There's not a whole lot to it, but it's the one that the industry uses. And then that reminds me, too. Uh, so here's porcel a little porcelain paper chip. Right? Oh, nice. Nothing fancy to look at, necessarily. Yeah. But I want to let your viewership or listenership know that I'm rubbing my hand on it right now. This is not an acceptable test for if it's slip and skid resistant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Because I'll tell you, Angelique, <laughs> I, I do it too, right? I always do it. The first thing you do is you go feel it. Well, like, you want to feel it. Yeah. yeah. That's um, good. <laughs> yeah. I'm a tactile customer, right? Uh, however, uh, some of the tiles can feel much smoother than you would expect and still have no problem meeting the measure for wet and dry slip and skid resistance. And then some of them feel like they're reasonably rough, but they don't live outside very well. That rough texture maybe collects a bunch of debris and it gets slippery because it's not okay. designed the right way. There's just, it's not, it's not as simple as rub your hand on it. Yes, this passes the test. Because hmm. right? it has to live outside afterwards. And yeah. Outside means things are going to collect on it and spill on it. And, yeah. etc and there are some and this has been happening in the tile industry for a long time people wanted more textured tiles for like hotel lobbies and things like that for people not okay to yeah and um and so putting texture on a tile is easy putting texture on a tile and making it easy to clean is more difficult uh, well i was going to ask you about that because <laughs> like yeah i'm thinking oh green slime growing on these tiles i mean right. I, one of the benefits of porcelain paving is that it's not porous so it can't right, it get, absorb anything it can't get into it but still does that mean that more sits on top on right. a gritty surface okay. yeah in fact even if it's not very gritty i've every once in a while have the complaint that I put porcelain in and now it rained or the sprinklers went on or something and there's water standing on the porcelain and I don't want to walk on it. It's dangerous. Well, it's tested for wet slip resistance, so it's not dangerous. And the reason that you're not used to seeing water sitting on top of your pavement is because it always soaks right in. Yeah. Right? So with porcelain, it's not going to soak. In. So yeah. it's going to be there until you push it off with a broom or a squeegee or it evaporates. That's, that's pretty much it. And Even with proper slope, surface tension will still keep some water on top of the pavement. Because of that, yeah. Yeah, it gets to I the mean, edge and stops. Okay. Right. And so it is, I mean, every time you use something different, this is what's challenging about using new things new. is that, right. well, but it's worth, you know, you have your clients deciding between these different paving yeah. choices and you have, you know, this one takes more maintenance 
but is more slippy and this one takes less me you know so you, you want to weigh up the options accurately for your clients mm -hmm. um and so it's it's educating them on what they're gonna see you you might see yeah. some water standing on it splash yeah. in the water don't complain about it just splash in the water <laughs> right 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 pretty much pretty much <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and, well, and to that point, and so that actually brings up another really good point. Even if the homeowner is really desirous of a porcelain paver, you know, patio, pool, deck, driveway, whatever it happens to be, one of the reasons I posed that question on Facebook, which it was a Facebook forum for hardscapers, right, is for the installer. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I po posed that question is because I know for a fact that there are a lot of people that want a porcelain pavement and get talked out of it by the installer. Right. And it's for some of those same reasons, just, you know, a little bit unsure about how to install properly, afraid of callbacks because of ongoing joint sand. Maintenance. Well, you know? and to be fair, we've all had these things where you think you are right. getting the next best thing. Um, and and I, I what I thought was interesting is that, you know, exterior porcelain has been in circulation for a really long time it's just not in the u.s right. and i think and i didn't know that about um i guess we're saying is like 10 years ago that it just got sent out and people didn't right. know how to install it and you have some problems i mean that'll put anybody off <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, using sure. something new um yeah. but i guess the 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 flip side of the coin is there there's a lot of experience with porcelain mm -hmm. paving. It's knowing yourself where you're getting it. And right. not all porcelain is maybe created equal because okay. it is a man-made product. Um, and, but the testing is a, a huge thing because am I right in that most porcelain is made in Europe or uh -huh. no? I, I oh, think no. it's fair to say that most of it is. Yeah, there's a lot in okay. India and a lot in China um, and a decent amount, a pretty good amount in the U.S. as well. Okay. So uh, what I can tell you is that globally, Mohawk Industries, which is Dow Tile's parent company, is, is by quite a ways the number one ceramic and porcelain manufacturer in the world. Worldwide. Wow. Okay. So lots and lots of different countries manufacturing. Yeah. But, you know, I, I do think the the dry laying, is that how you call it, of, of porcelain yeah. isn't something that has been done, at least in the in the UK as much as say, it seems like agree. it's already been done here. <laughs> yeah, UK, definitely not as much. Probably some areas in like Italy and Germany that I know that they have experimented with it. So, um, some people putting out some thicker porcelain mm. uh, have experimented with that as well. Um, you know, I think that we have dialed in uh, probably a, a, a very solid assembly for still doing a dry lay. Um, I would still encourage, you know, any installer doing it that way to set an expectation that there will likely be some ongoing joint material maintenance. Okay. But also set the expectation that that's not, that, that's not a failure of the pavement. That's not going to cause any structural problems with the pavement. And the porcelain material itself, you know, you don't have to seal it. It's not really going to age. So yeah. if you want to do a complete dry lay, you've got a recommended system, you know, for permanent spacers, okay. edge restraint, and joint material. Um, but with a little bit of movement, that joint material is going to be able to withstand a certain amount, and then yeah. it'll be it'll go past that you know sort of limit that it's got to withstand movement. So mm -hmm. can I go on one little bit about? Oh, of course, of yeah, yeah. So we've got a, a system that's more of a hybrid. We recently, at Daltile, our exteriors program, we're really kind of all in on the Romex installation system right now. Uh, but they have an interesting sort of hybrid system that if you don't want to have the whole project bonded to that sort of porous concrete slab that you make with their truss binding material, you can just make a truss curb, right? An underground curb that's the width or maybe a little bit wider than your outermost porcelain oh, paver. Okay. On that paver to that, then the entire infield, you know, the field all around the, the curb or up against structure, whatever it happens to be, just do a loose chipstone, but still ah. still back butter your tile and bond to the chipstone. And in that case, you don't need permanent spacers. 
the curb makes your edge restraint. And now there's so much more lateral stability because you've glued all that chip stone to the bottom of the paver and it's all stuck in to chip stone. It's totally interlocked in there. It, it can't go okay. side to side. Yeah, so yeah. If you, if you do that and use the Romex joint material, it still give you a five year warranty on the assembly. Yeah. You know, where, where you're not going to have joint problems. Okay. Yeah. And then it's, it, I guess it's um, still quite permeable as well as a system. Still permeable and it installs, yeah. it installs almost the same as you would if you weren't bonding anything because you have to do edge restraint. The only yeah. really addition on this is you have to back butter the tile. But once you get good at it, a couple of five gallon pails to flip the tile over one person's butter, mm. another person's laying, it's really fast. Yeah. And since and, you don't have to do trash for the entire field, it takes a lot of cost out too. Now that's for pedestrian only vehicular. We want you to do a full trash bed or bond to a slab. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. So then, then that's given three different options of how to lay it. Yeah. Um, so I haven't looked back at that Facebook post. I saw it when you first posted it. What are people saying? <laughs> you know, we, we got sort of the, the whole gamut of objections, some uh, some a lot better than others, and some objections based on sort of known, you know, falsehoods out there or myths, like things, uh. that, things that somebody has said and grew legs and don't don't have any sort of scientific backing to them, right? Just okay. That, that's out there with every material, right? It is. Uh, one I found interesting was, well, if I drop one and break it, it's a lot more expensive than if I had dropped the concrete paper and broke it, which that's fair, <laughs> right? Uh, to a certain extent, if the tile breaks, it's probably going to shatter. So you're not going to have maybe a usable piece for cuts, whereas a, a concrete paper, you know, you might. You might. Okay. But in all honesty, if we're talking more uh, apples to apples, say a 24 by 24 porcelain to a 24 by 24 concrete, right? Not versus a four by eight. That doesn't count. <laughs> That's not fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, if we compare, you know, apples to apples in that way, they're basically, you know, depending on the country of origin for the porcelain and how far you are from the plant for the concrete, they could be the same exact cost or the concrete could actually be more. Per really? Per basis. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of your made in the USA porcelain is at a very competitive price point now. It's only nine pounds per square foot. So it's very freight friendly. So we can go three times the amount of square foot on a truck than a six centimeter concrete paver. Wow. So okay. How much farther you can go and not have yeah. a lot of freight burden. Well, and you know what was getting big when I left um, the UK was the really thin um, wall cladding. Yeah. What What do you call that? Wall cladding? <laughs> yeah, cladding, cladding is fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and often, those, you're talking about the really large panels? Yes, like yeah. four so feet by often, four feet, something like that. Oh, yeah. We make them five and a quarter by ten and a half. Oh, okay. Okay. Huge. Yeah. And only yeah. six mil or 12 mil thickness. So those, okay. those products are you know, often used for flooring and wall and ceiling inside. Um, okay. And then for outside, you can bond it to a certain backer and then mechanically attach it to the outside of a building up to, you know, skyscraper height. So a ventilated okay. facade is what that's called or a rain screen system. Okay. Yeah. 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 And those are, are, those are really cool. And actually that same material in a matte finish, it makes one of the most gorgeous outdoor countertops you can possibly have because you can have a really, really like delicate Italian marble look, but it's porcelain. It has all the same properties. It won't scratch, it won't stain, it won't fade. Totally UV okay. stain. Yeah, it's really, yeah. It's really and a so gorgeous is, countertop. Is that being used a lot here or still? Not in? yet, not okay. yet. More, more commercial spaces so far. I mean, between fabrication and cutouts and things like that, it's going to take a minute for really to find purchase in the broader network. But yeah. commercial jobs and custom home jobs probably, you know, is, is a great, great, you know, couple of segments for that. And then higher end hardscape guys will get into it soon enough. Well, because, yeah, we were using them for, um, you know, freestanding walls, outdoor mm -hmm sunrooms things like that so you know you're talking about for the kitchen countertops but it could be for the the whole kitchen yeah 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 absolutely. so i mean like <laughs> so yeah. yeah we've got a yeah. we've got a picture in our catalog with just one piece with a cutout for the fireplace and that's it it's you know 
that's the fi outdoor very fire sleek camp. and yeah. well and less maintenance because the joints are often what cause right causes maintenance before anything else so that's yeah correct and with the joints yeah. if you use the right joint material you shouldn't have maintenance issues. <laughs> awesome yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is it. Talking about doing it right. And yeah, um, yeah. and you you presented at our um, Sync Live event recently in Atlanta. Did you get any good questions there or, yeah, or challenges? Yeah, lots, lots of good questions. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I found out about a challenger I had, but he, he wasn't willing to speak up during the presentation, only uh, only later on at the top golf where I was not in attendance. But <laughs> oh, really? Oh, no, that's not fair. Then yeah, that's no, not a proper challenge. The next day, uh, you know, apparently, you had some choice words, but uh, I would have been happy to. Oh. I would have been happy to debate him. No, nothing bad. Just, uh, oh, okay. just I didn't. I thought that guy was full of it, basically. Right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Other than that, though, no. Well, a this of, happens uh, sometimes. Yeah, a, a lot of really good questions, and a lot of people came back to our booth and. Immediately when I was done presenting to have, you know, a larger conversation about it. So, well, yeah, I the, did, I did kick you off the stage the first did, time. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, <laughs> I was ready to go, but I didn't want to be rude to the audience. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> no, well, I, did, uh, I did feel bad, but we were trying to keep things on schedule and, you know, we are like, okay, next. But like, yep. but, but I thought totally it was good. fantastic totally that you were getting so much interaction. Cause I think, you know, especially at these events, you know, it's, you know, quiet afterwards. And, you know, yeah. if you're asking questions, you bring a lot of attention, but you were getting lots of questions. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. always a good sign. Um, so and and you also mentioned the application of pedestals. And I think you have those some in the in your frame. Right yeah, there. the ones right there aren't the ones that I'm really. Those are those are a competitive oh, okay. brand of what I'm selling. Oh, <laughs> the other ones I've got are in a. I'll grab. I'll grab one. Real okay, quick. okay. <laughs> okay, here's an example. Well, here's an example of our preferred vendor's pedestal. Awesome. But it's a very simple. It's a very simple system, and a lot of people are kind of afraid of them. And there's really no reason to be. I mean, compared to you know, getting a paddle mixer and mixing powder with water and sand and aggregates and things like that, that's much more complicated than this. This is just basically like Legos, right? So it, it screws up or down for height adjustment. Mm -hmm. And then I, I picked the bad one. It was, you can see this yellow ring in here. It's tightened yeah. all the way down right now. If it were loosened up, this top bit would actually have some range of motion. Oh, okay. And what, yeah. And what that does is when you build a pedestal on a, what's typically on a roof deck, not always, but the vast majority of the time. So that roof deck is what we call a flat roof, but it's really a low slope roof, right? Yeah. So there's some, there's some slope to the roof because any water that falls on it has to find a scupper or find a drain or otherwise get off the roof. Yeah. Uh, it's not good for a building. So in this case, you put the pedestal on the slope roof. And typically you would shim underneath or shim on top to make a level floor, mm -hmm. right? And then the floor can be level because the joints between the paving units are empty, right? So there's okay. nothing in them. So the water yeah. just runs through, hits that slope roof deck and runs to drain and gets off the roof. So with this one being free flowing on the top, which it's not right now because it's locked down and I can't <laughs> unlock it with my finger. Um, if you have pavers of equal weight resting on the top, it will automatically compensate for up to a five degree slope of the floor. So that makes this particular system really, really fast and easy to work with. Yeah. Well, and I always thought like, so in Scotland, we had some houses that had ventilation like under, under the floor level. And, you know, we'd have clients say, I don't want to a patio here and you can't block up that airflow yeah that and so, yeah and so um you know it's really a, a i saw a lot of potential for just doing it even on on earth but i guess you would have to put little um concrete pads under yeah. each one would you yeah 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 exactly but exactly. you know and there, in I, that I case that, oh look at now that you can see, now you can see it'll move right and compensate yeah. and then those are the spacer spacer bars right okay so it's yeah. really it's a really very simple system and you can build these things up really high like over two feet high even three feet high and uh you know then you've got a usable space up top 
totally flat and level. All your utilities are hidden underneath, but you can yeah. still lift up the paver and get to them if you need to. And now you've got a beautiful, usable, functional space on the top of the building. And who doesn't yeah. want to hang that? Yeah. And you could even go, you know, instead of, um, you know, you pick a gray patio and then the trends change and you could change out the colors really easily. Yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you, you know, if you had a if you had a big fancy event, we could make a red carpet out of red pavers oh. for that event, right? <laughs> oh, that would be cool. Yeah. And if the trend changes, you get to sell your old patio. Right? Yeah, because you haven't bonded it to perfect. anything. It's not. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't well, age outside. Yeah. So if you want to, well, because you, I mean, I do have friends that do things like that. Like they redecorate their living rooms yeah. like every yeah. other year or something, but <laughs> like you could redecorate your outdoor space very yeah. easily that way. And literally sell the old material if you wanted to. That or, is or really gift cool. It. <laughs> yeah. Gift it to your or move it somewhere else. College. Like, right, yeah. okay, well now I, or you could try out a patio and go, do I want a patio here or not? <laughs> use it as a tester and then, okay, now bond it in place. And then those, use those the are some first world problems for sure. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, it's funny, you know, as a, as a designer, like I've done a lot of design work and then you go, well, um, if you can't visualize it, it makes it hard for the clients to, to figure it out. So, right. or figure out what size patio they want. And, um, so it, there, there may be some place in there for just like trial, trial patios. You know, what's, what's funny, this isn't necessarily anything that's that important to your audience at large, but for our architectural sales reps, you know, we, we created like a vinyl photograph version of full size pavers. Because if we have a 32 by 32 paver, our arc rep's not going to wear the high heels and carry 65 pounds of tile up two flights of stairs, right? Yeah. Um, so now, yeah, now we do that with a full size piece. You just unfold it, then you put a little, you know, little four by four chip on there and say, this is for scale and pattern. This is for true color and texture. That's a great idea. Yeah, it's smart. It, 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 that it really, is. And it so really it helps our staff to present it more consistently. Well, and I also think um, landscape designers, residential landscape designers and landscape architects would like that facility too. So yeah. can they just call up, call your yeah, number? Right, and... right now it's not a for <laughs> giveaway or for purchase. Okay. <laughs> so please okay. don't call me asking for it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not saying that down the road that might not be something that we would provide, you know, probably, I don't know if there would be a small cost. See, that would go to the designer. If it was a design build firm, it's easier, you know, you kick a rebate yeah. or something like that, you know, or you discount back on that. But, you know, I, I love the tool and, uh, you know, we're always trying to think of ways to make it easier to present for the design community. Yeah. Well, um, Yeah. I think I think it's a great tool to have and also helping clients visualize what they're getting before they press the button. So, yeah. um, yeah, maybe um, if you're in the audience and you like that, reach out to me, maybe, and let <laughs> us know. And then we can uh, see, see, let Phil know the results of the <laughs> of the query. Do a, little, do a little test and learn on that. We'll yeah. Yeah. Out. Let's do that. <laughs> Well, awesome. Yeah, well, you know, well uh, real, go ahead. Can I just pop something in real sure. quick uh, before I forget about, you know, the, the famous posts, not really on Facebook, you know, I, I kind of posed two things, which I believe is why it got as much traffic as it did in the main, main thing of the two. Well, the first one is I've, you know, we've got 150 architectural reps across the country who are going to be talking to specifiers about our exteriors program. So we will be driving specifications for the Cal Tile and most likely Romex and Profilitech pedestals and some specific systems and MAPE for other bonded applications. Um, because we're going to be driving specifications, that really needs to compel the installer base to be, to get trained. Yeah. Because these are good. There's going to be hard specs. It's, no, you can't. That's a great point. So how do they get trained? Well, we've got, uh, I've got a playlist on YouTube that has, shoot, I don't know, six hours plus 
of educational content for bonded applications, for Romex style applications, for pedestals, even for flexible base. Uh, one job in St. George, Utah, where we follow the entire install of a flexible base over permeable subgrade. Okay. In that case, we don't even put any joint material in. We just left them open and, and built a perfectly flat floor. And it's been in for over two years and it's in perfect shape right now. So there's some okay. really high value educational content. We're going around and putting on some uh, seminars and some in-ground displays. It's where you're you know, your higher viz or your larger hardscape yards around the country. I mean, we're really doing as much as we can with a relatively small force dedicated to the exteriors program while also trying to educate our really large force at large on you know sort of the basics yeah we have some specialized reps from the hardscape segment that know a lot about installation and we've got good video content as well really good that's fantastic well what we'll do is um on the show notes i can put a link to that so yeah, um, people can find it easily. And um, like we talked about before, maybe we do something in the um, in the publication on, you know, like the three methods that you recommend for for installing porcelain paving. I think that would be nice and educational and and maybe get some comfort out there with you yeah. using something new. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, I would love to. I would love to. And for the hardscape segment, at least, you know, this new Romex uh, installation system, it installs like and similar to installing chipstone right now. You're just screening out chipstone. You just have to put a little binder in it first. Otherwise, okay. it's very, very like and similar. And if anybody's been paying attention, you'll know that it's sturdy because we drove a, a tank over it about 50 times. I meant to ask you about that <laughs> earlier. Yeah, great. great. <laughs> I got a picture in front of the picture of the tank yeah, right, <laughs> with right. you <laughs> at, a quip, at Hardscape North America. Yeah, so. that's right. No, yeah. it, uh, it had held up to very heavy truck traffic for six months. I mean, fully loaded dump trucks turning on it, fully loaded 18 wheelers with a Moffat on the back. So we decided to do something to, we knew that it was going to hold up to the tank straight line, but we didn't know if it was going to hold up to it, you know, breaking on it, turning on it, pivoting on it. Uh, and it did. So the bond didn't break, the tile didn't break, the joint material didn't come out. So we're all in on Romex. I'm telling you guys, every single landscape architect that I present Romex to, especially if I got someone with me from Romex, the specifiers lose their mind. So it is, it's coming, right? It, it's absolutely yeah. coming. We've got to have a, a good sort of three-way partnership between manufacturer, specifier, and installer uh, to make sure this grows as fast as it can for everybody because you're not getting callbacks. And uh, you're installing systems that are very, very durable and low maintenance. So it's something that's going to only grow in popularity. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Well, great job leading the, leading the country on it. (laughs) (laughs) And how can they, how can our audience um, reach you for more information? I guess we'll, we'll put that YouTube link. Do you yeah, want YouTube to YouTube link? Yeah. You can visit our website, uh, www.daltile. That's D A L T I L E, daltile.com slash exteriors. And exteriors has no E on the beginning. It starts with the X and then the rest of it spells out the same. So daltile.com slash exteriors is the best way to find more information. Love it. Great. Well, thanks for being on the show today and look forward to working with you more, Phil. All right. Likewise, thanks for having me. And let's let's plug your let's plug your event, by the way. Oh, so, okay. Let's uh, do that. Recently, recently <laughs> exhibited at Sync Live. It was the second year of the show, right? I mean, yes, that's right. Third, but second under that brand, if I remember correctly. That's right. And uh, just had some very, very, very high value, good quality leads come out of that. The attendees are absolutely decision makers. And uh, some of them, some of them even bring around some of their regional staffs to uh, align to the decision that they're trying to make while at the show. Uh, and there's just a lot of opportunities for educational content too. So uh, an interesting show that blends the three phases, design, installation, and maintenance. And having those three phases finally talk to each other, I think will build more uh, economical and more uh, sustainable projects out in the marketplace. So really respect and appreciate what you're doing and great show. Oh, oh, thank you so much. Well, you know, we, we believe we're, we're bringing something um, to the market that's unique and, and can elevate everybody. Even if, even if you're only doing one part of, of that whole cycle, 
by learning from those around you, we can, we can, um, yeah, just get better solutions, um, yeah. be it longer lasting longevity or quality. Well, usually that goes hand in hand, but also, um, more environmental as well. So more sustainable and, um, life cycle costs for maintenance. Exactly. Exactly. No, I, Thanks for selling it. <laughs> no. it, it, it. It's an easy sale because from what I've seen is every time each person in the chain or, or however it tangentially involved, they made the entire process. The whole thing is a system. And if the different parts of the system, just like a company, if your company is all siloed and marketing's not talking to sales, sales isn't talking to production, the, co the company is a mess. This is a system made up of independent companies hmm. but if they talk to each other the whole machine works so much better and you're going to have a lot of happier end users as a result well and our industry raises you know our our visibility and our professionalism so that's the goal for for all of these things huh what you're doing as well so Thank you for being at our show. I really appreciate you being there and teaching all of our audience a lot about porcelain. And I'm glad you had a lot of interest. So yeah, great. My pleasure. And thank you. Angela, awesome. Appreciate it. Right, well, thanks, Phil. You, you too. Back. Okay. Right. Have a great time. Bye. Bye.